getting ready for our Christmas week, and uh, I don't know. I feel like hopeful. It's going to be good. It's going to be a great week. Amen? And Because um, God's good. Anyway, during prayer time, I just kept seeing this picture that Roxanne had painted, and I was like, I just felt like it was this room, and we're in there, and then these sheep are there, and we're those sheep, you know? We got a shepherd. He's going to take care of us. He's promised to always take care of us, and um, he's in the midst of that, and we just thank you, Jesus, so much that you are our good shepherd, that you take care of your sheep, and I thank you, Lord, that when you were born, you revealed yourselves to shepherds and sheep. First. And so I just thank you, Jesus, so much for that. And so right now, we just want to spend our time worshiping you, the Good Shepherd. We just glorify and worship you. And thank you, Father God, for this week. And we want to just look forward to what you're going to do because you are good and your mercy endures forever. In Jesus' name, amen.
praise you, Lord. We just exalt you, Jesus. Let's just raise our hands to the Lord right now. We just exalt you, Lord. We glorify you, Lord Jesus. Be glorified. Be exalted in all the earth. Let, let your name be proclaimed throughout the nations, Lord God. That you, your glory would rise up in all the earth, Lord God. People would know. The people would know how awesome you are. That you're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That you're the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world. And we just worship you, Lord. We bow down to you, Lord God. And we just declare that you are worthy of all praise and honor and glory. All power and might and dominion belongs to you in Jesus' name. Your name is above every name. Every name that can be named, your name is above it. Lord Jesus, you are King. You are Lord the Lord of hosts, hallelujah. Come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, bring your salvation to the ends of the earth, Lord God. Bring your salvation, bring your healing power. In Jesus' name, we worship you, Lord God. Glorious King, hallelujah, hallelujah. We just pray that you would just speak to our hearts tonight. Lord God, that you would just uh, bring us to a full, the full flame of our faith, Lord God. Just breathe, breathe on us, Lord. Breathe on us. Let the wind of the Holy Spirit just come into this place and, and just change us, Lord God. Put a fire on us, Lord Jesus. Let us be so passionate and on fire for you that all we can do, we only have eyes to see you, Lord God. And your love covers everything in all the earth. Your earth, the earth is filled with your glory, Lord God, because everywhere we see you in Jesus' name. Thank you for it, Lord God. Change us, Lord, change us. Hallelujah, hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You know, I was just thinking, you know, it's Christmas time and we see all the presents under the tree. Yeah. And, you know, better than just gifts in the natural, it's, it's gifts in the spirit being, you know, it's, but it's in the covering that we got to unravel it to see what gifts we have. And so it's interesting because it's at the foot of the tree. Jesus was hung on a tree for our forgiveness. And he didn't only forgive us and save us, but he wants us to operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I think this is a good time just to ask the Lord to open it up because it says when he ascended on high, he gave gifts to men yeah. and women. And so I'm just going to pray a simple prayer. Um, so Lord, we thank you, Jesus, that no one's excluded from, from your gifts. Thank you. It's by your grace. And we'd ask right now, Lord, that you would unravel every gift that you've given every person here in the Holy Spirit. If it's prophecy, if it's healing, word of knowledge, tongues. We know we have access to all of it, but we ask that you would reveal um, just the gifts you want us to flow in tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, Sunday night. Welcome, welcome. Praise God. Christmas week, right? Yes. And, uh, um, you know, uh, I don't know how to introduce this, but... Uh, you know, if you, if you let the devil, he'll steal everything from us. If you just, if you just be, like, uh, noncommittal about stuff or have no opinion about things, he'll just start stealing stuff from you. You know, and, and uh, you know, we have Christmas, December 25th. And a lot of people are like, no, nah, Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. Well, let's look at this. Because I want to take something back from the devil that you can celebrate, December 25th. Jesus was born on December 25th. And this is from the greatest historian, uh, living historian I've ever read, is a guy named Bill Furderer, and he does a, a uh, he, he just does history things all the time. Anybody ever read this guy? 
Yeah, this, he's amazing. So this is based on him. So I'm just going to read this because it really helped me. I read it a couple of years ago. I was like, hey, this is awesome. So Christianity is the largest religion in the world, making Christmas Day the most celebrated religious holiday on the planet. The date of Christmas on December 25th has been studied for centuries. Some think shepherds would not have been in the field with their flocks in the winter, but this argument loses credibility when one considers the moderate climate of Bethlehem in December with an average daily temperature of around 50 degrees. Some think December 25th was chosen to erase the pagan Roman winter solstice festival of Saturnalia, but this is discounted when we realize the winter solstice is December 21 and 22, with celebrations beginning as early as December 17 and lasting no later than December 23rd. We can determine the date Jesus was born if we find the date of the conception of John the Baptist. Okay, so follow me here. Luke, uh, John's, John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, was a Levite, priest of the family of Abijah. In Luke 1.5, in the time of Herod, in the time of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abid, Abijah. 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 That's good. Elijah, but Abijah. So King David, King David had divided the Levite priests into 24 family groups, which took turns ministering at the altar in Jerusalem on a rotating schedule for a week at a time, twice a year. This is just history, okay? First Chronicles 24, 1 through 10, the sons of Aaron served as a priest. David separated them into divisions for their appointed order of ministering. The first lot fell to Jehoarib, the second to Jedidiah, the third to Hiram, the fourth to Seorium, the fifth to Mal Malkijah, the sixth to Mijamin, the seventh to Hekaz, the eighth to Abijah. 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 And the list continues through the 24 families. So we have these lists going on, and they're going to they're gonna minister a week at a time. There's 24 of them, and they do that twice a year. This is the order. It, the order is set in the Bible of the order that they do this. Abijah's division served week 8 and 32, and Solomon initiated the courses when he dedicated the first temple in the 10th century B.C. 2 Chronicles 8, 12 Solomon, in keeping with the ordinance of his father David, he appointed the divisions of the priests for their duties. So, when Abijah's, when was Abijah's course in the Roman calendar? Is the, is the question we need to ask. The Babylonian Talmud confirms that the family of Jehoarib was on duty when the first temple was burned on the ninth day of Av, 587 BC. Okay, this is just history. Then history shows that the second temple was burned in August 70 AD on the ninth day of Av. The priestly course of Jehoarib was again on duty. Seven weeks later would be the course of Abijah, which would be the second week of the Jewish month of Tishri. This week on the Roman calendar is the last week in September. So... At the end of the reign of King Herod in Judea, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, would have been serving in the temple the last week of September. His wife Elizabeth would have conceived John the Baptist soon after that. Luke, 8, Luke 1 8. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. All the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. The Byzantine Rite Church calendar commemorates September 23rd as the date of the conception of John the Baptist, as does the second century writings of St. James. You guys following this? So when was John the Baptist conceived? September 23rd. Now Elizabeth was in her sixth month of pregnancy, the end of March, when she, visited, when she was visited by her younger cousin Mary, Luke 1.26. In the sixth month of her pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's, na the virgin's name was Mary. 
The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel said, The Holy Spirit will come on you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. March 25 is the date the church calendar celebrates the Feast of the Annunciation. That's Gabriel's visit. The Archbishop of Constantinople in the 4th century wrote this, Zechariah was priest during the Feast of Tabernacles in the year John the Baptist was conceived. We can then count off the months of Elizabeth's pregnancy and date Mary's conception at the sixth month of Elizabeth's. Then we count another nine months to arrive at the birth date of Christ. Nine months after March 25 is December 25, the traditional date of the birth of Jesus. Sure, I'll print those out. So, so we can celebrate Christmas. You don't have to cancel Christmas this year. It's official. You know, like I said, Satan will steal anything he can. Anything he can, he'll just steal. Oh, you, you Christians, that's not really Chris, Jesus' birthday. Yes, it is. Anyway, well, now you have reason to, to believe. It's like, hey, it makes sense. This makes sense. December 25. Anyway, I like that. It helps me. I hope it helps you. <laughs> I know, it's so tedious, but I wanted to read the whole thing. I was going to put them in the back, but I'm like, those people won't read it. I'm just going to read it to them. Now I know everybody heard it. So here we go. All right. So let's pray, and then we're going to have a, a short message here. So Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your love. I thank you, Lord God, you love us so much. You came to the earth, <laughs> and you didn't do it hidden. You did it in full view. We, anybody who wants to study it, anybody who wants to look at it, anybody who wants to know can, can have full awareness of everything you've done. You've done it out in the open. Jesus, you came, and you spoke, and you taught, taught the people, and you came and said, whosoever will, come to me. Come and drink and be a part of the kingdom of God. And Lord, we want to be a part of the kingdom of God. We want to be the whosoever. We want to run to your presence. Lord, we want to come at every invitation you are giving. We want to come and respond to it. And so, Lord, I pray that we have sensitive hearts. We have ears to hear, and we have sensitive hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. amen. Two weeks ago, I talked about uh, falling, falling in love with the Lord. And I liked that message. It was really good. And uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk about how to fall in love with God tonight. Amen. So this is, this is, love is the most important thing you could ever learn about, live in. If we could live in love, all your, all your problems would vanish. If you could live in love, all your problems would be over instantly. Just by living, by understanding the love of God. Just by knowing the love of God. It, it's amazing. So... We, if you're going to fall in love with God, I'm going to give you uh, the number one tip, and that is this. Set aside time to talk. Remember when you were falling in love? Remember when you were falling in your first love? You talked for hours. You talked for hours. You just talked and talked and talked. Didn't we talk a lot, Tammy? We were at a restaurant, and we were talking, and we got lunch, and then we kept talking, and it was dinner time, so we ordered dinner. At the Junction Restaurant in Fort Collins, Colorado. <laughs> and it was like, we just, you just talk. You just talk, talk, talk. I want to tell you, when it comes to you and God, you've got a lot to talk about. Okay? You've got a new boundless kingdom to talk about. He wants to explain it to you. Colossians 1.13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. So he's got a lot to talk about. There's tons to talk about. A, a limitless continent of discovery in, the, in, in, in your new life with God, okay? Now, I want to I paint a picture here for you. So imagine after falling in love with your perfect soulmate, so you, you guys have, have been talking and you're falling in love with this person, 
and they tell you something. They say, I have another language that I would like you to learn because if we, this is, and, he, and this person tells you, this is my native language. And if we could talk in this language, it is hundreds of times more expressive than the way we've been talking. And you say, huh? Uh uh, oh, 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 oh. Because <laughs> basically, that's what you've been using as language compared to what, what he wants to teach you. I want, I want to ask you, I just want to ask you, if you were in that situation and you were falling in love with somebody and they said, would you please learn a, a, a language? Because this is going to be 100 times more expressive. And we can talk about things at a deeper level, we can explain things, we can, we can explore things that you've never thought possible, but it all, it's all going to take you learning this new language. The question is, would you be willing to do that? Would you put the effort for it? Would you buy the, what's the program? The Rosetta Stone and, and listen to it and spend half hour a day and, and work on it. Would you do that so that you could learn this new language so that your relation, for the whole purpose of having a better relationship with this person? And I'm telling you, that is what God is asking of us. Will you learn this new language? Are you willing to put in that kind of effort? Job 33, 14 says this, For God does speak, now one way, now another, though man may not perceive it. God is speaking. He's speaking. He's speaking. And he's speaking one way and another, and sometimes we don't perceive it. And God's like, would you please learn this language? Would you just please learn the language I'm talking? And sometimes people are like, well, I had a dream, and uh, ha, 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 I was speeding in a car, and, uh, you know, my dad came and knocked me out of the car, and then I went into a lake, and I, I was underwater, and then a big fish swallowed me. Ha, 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 isn't that funny? Dreams are funny. And that's the end of your exploring the dream. You will not put even one second of effort <laughs> into maybe learning the language. Yeah. That's a good point. So we're going to have to decide ahead of time. I'm going to learn the language. I'm going to learn the language because there's a lot more God wants to talk to me about. Okay? So imagine you fall in love with a person writing love letters. Just writing love letters back and forth. Send her a love letter, she sends me a love letter. Send her a love letter, she sends me a love letter. We don't even live in the same state, but we're just sending love letters back, on the, back and forth. And, and somebody says, you, you can't imagine any other way to communicate. This is, what, this is how we're in love, is these, through these letters. How could it possibly be better? What, what are you describing? How could it be better? Because you can't even imagine that you could talk on the phone with this person. And it, but it's totally different. But we fell in love through the, listen to me, but we fell in love with the letters, and so I'm comfortable with the letters. Yeah, but you could talk on the phone. Yeah, but that's, that scares me because that's going to be something new and different. What if I don't like her voice? You know? What if she laughs like this? <laughs> anyway, we had a friend who said, oh, never mind, it's a long story. What if you went out with a girl and she was beautiful, but when she laughed, she laughed like this. <laughs> what would you do? We'd always tell her, we'd, I'd dump her in a second. <laughs> anyway, that's a, that's a joke. But you can't even imagine talking any other way. So I, I want you to go back into this world where you're, you're falling in love with somebody through the letters. And then all of a sudden, somebody suggests you could even meet with them in person. And you're like, oh my gosh, that's way too scary. That's way too scary. What, you know, how's that going to be? Let's just go back to the love letters. You know why? Because the love letters was comfortable. Love letters was at a safe distance. I am telling you right now, God is asking you, let's go a little farther. Let's talk on the phone. Okay? Let's meet face to face. And I'm I am, it is not without fear to go to another level because there's always gonna be something different about it than what you're used to. But God is asking, will you learn another language? Will you learn another language? All right, 
We're never going to lose our letters, because I'm making an analogy with the Bible, actually. We're never going to lose our letters. But you know what? These point to Jesus. This points to Jesus. And you refuse to come to me to have eternal life. That's what he told the Pharisees. And so we, gotta, we love our letters, but we need to come to the face of God. And we need not be scared of it. But I think God knows that it's going to take a little bit of learning on our behalf to understand the languages that he's speaking. Okay? So that's, that's okay. But, ha- but say this. Say, God, even though I'm scared, I want to go in. Even though I'm, I'm fearful of moving forward, I want to go as close as possible. Now, if our priority is other things, we will not go in, even if we're invited. If our priority is other things, even if we're invited, we will not go in. And if your life gets wrapped up in the things of this world, Luke 14, 17, at that time, at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses why they couldn't come and be with the king in his presence. And I think that can relate to us. It's like, you know what? No, I'll just stick with this. Love always says yes. But here's the thing. Love will always say yes. If you were truly in love and you were having this relationship, the chance to talk on the phone would be absolutely yes. Because love overrides any kind of other hesitancy. And if you could be with the person, you would absolutely say "Ah, yes, yes, because love will always say yes. So we need to let our love carry us into these situations. You cool? So if we, so we, we're going to decide, all of us together, we're going to decide to learn God's preferred language. So Matthew 13, 34, this is God's preferred language. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. (laughs) This is going to make you a crazy, crazy religious nut. Because you are going to start perceiving parables in the whole creation. And, And what is it? It's God talking to you. And boy, that's going to make you a spiritual nut. You're going to say, well, God, God's, I think God's trying to talk to me. I think God showed me something. And your friends are going to be like, you've gone off the deep end. But I want, to, I want to talk about what the Bible says about parables. First of all, the, the, the definition of parables, well, here's what parables are. Analogy or lessons. A parables are analogies or lessons which take the form of stories Movies, testimonies, dreams, coincidences, symbols, license plates, etc. Our, our beloved uh, fearless leader, Roger, has an entire history with God with license plates, meaning something. He sees a, he'll ask God a specific question, and he'll, and he'll see a license plate, and you should read his book. New book coming out. When is that coming out? Fire on the... Soon! Anyway, his testimony. He has, a, he has a big testimony, but he's rewriting his testimony in smaller volumes. But, it, but there's a lot of God giving supernatural direction through license plates, them saying something. And I want to tell you something. A lot of us would be like, a license plate? What could that mean? Nah, I don't want to bother thinking about that or learning that. You know, it's a whole new expression that, that our friend here is interacting with God through, and we're not even touching it. God does speak. Now this way, and now the other, though man does not perceive it. Isn't that the truth? Yes. Yeah, it's amazing the way God will speak to somebody. So anyway, so things around us we once didn't notice can now be filled with, if we take parables as from God, as Jesus, wanting to have a love relationship with us. I'm telling you, it's all based on knowing how much he loves you and wants to talk to you. First of all, if you don't have that figured out, this whole, this whole adventure with God and parables is not going to make any sense to you. But once you realize he wants to talk to you at all times, in all ways, then everything is going to be filled with meaning. 
Habakkuk 2.14, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's pervasive. That is pervasive glory, that the earth is filled with the glory of the knowledge of God, filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. That's even beyond what I'm imagining, that everything is, shows the glory of God. Everything shows the glory of God. God is seen in everything around us. Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. I, am, I just want you to know that the Bible is teaching that we can communicate with God through parables that we're seeing in, in creation. That's all I'm saying. So don't be like, ah, oh, that couldn't be. Yes, it is. It's the Lord. Yes. Whoever wants to start talking to him, start learning the language. Start learning the language. When you have a dream and, and you have symbols in it, and so there's five or six symbols in it, type, get your computer out and type in Bible meaning water. And then do Bible meaning car or dream meaning car. If you do dream meaning, you're going to get some new age stuff. But sometimes it doesn't, sometimes dream dictionaries are so, are consistent enough where a bunch of people will say it's all the same thing. And even, and then when you go into all the Bible, the best is the Bible verses because the guy who's talking to you also wrote the Bible. By far the best is the Bible. But if, if the Bible doesn't, isn't, never talks about an auto, a semi-automatic weapon, you know, you could, you could say dream meaning, semi-automatic weapon, and see what somebody says. Of course, you don't believe everything they say. But it's like, that, that doesn't mean anything, but that means something. You guys cool with that? Yeah. Because what are you doing? You're learning a new language. And after, after a couple of years of this, you don't have to look up every, every phrase in a translation dictionary, right? When you first go to Mexico, every single word you look in the dictionary to see what it means. But after a while, you don't have to look in the dictionary for every single symbol. You cool with that? Yeah, you'll start to get good at it, and it'll be obvious. And then he'll, and then he'll combine symbols to mean more things. And will be like, whoa, that's really cool. These deeper conversations will change your life, I'm telling you but they're meaningless to other people. They'll be meaningless to other people. Listen to this, Luke 8, 10. Jesus said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables so, so that those seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. So you're like, God's talking to me. He's talking to me. You know, a white, a white bird flew straight across my windshield and I knew it meant this and your friends like mm -mm, means nothing <laughs> you know why because you're talking to God and he's not talking to God right. to them it doesn't mean anything but to you it does okay <laughs> you're we're spiritual kooks okay When you, when you begin this closer connection to God, something wonderful is going to happen. When you begin this closer thing where God's talking all the time, yes. he's talking to me all the time, yes. something wonderful is going to happen. Yes. You're going to stop living a life of random events, and you're going to start seeing a divine plan. Hello? Yes. You're going to stop living a life of random events, and you're going to start living a divine plan. Yes. I, want, I want to read Hebrews 12, 7. It says this. Endure hardship as discipline. That word also means teaching. So an event in your life, which you used to say, oh, I hate this. You're going to say, there's something to learn in this. Yeah. Yeah. Just think of the word discipline. Discipline by a loving father is intended to put you on a right path. Yeah. You know, you don't just hit the kid's thumb with a hammer, you give him instruction. It's not just random pain. And listen, I'm going to 
Get up here on the step. Yeah. It's not just random pain being inflicted on the kid. It is instructional discipline to, to move him on a path. And if you think that your life is filled with just random pain, like you're getting your, ha- ha- your finger smashed with a hammer, then you need to get a new God. Because God disciplines. We take hardship as discipline from God. That means there's an instructional path involved in the hardship. Wow, 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 wow. That means when my cat dies yesterday, which he did, boo-hoo. It's so sad, he was the coolest cat in town. Way cooler than your cat. I mean, this cat was super cool. I think he ate rat poison. Took him four days to die. His name was Jazz, and he was a really good cat. He was only five years old. We prayed so much. We prayed like crazy. Well, he, after we prayed a long time, that's when he died. <laughs> no, we, we prayed, we prayed, we prayed. He did, the devil did not steal him from me because he's going to be waiting for me. Yep. So he'll be there. Along with, we counted up seven others that are going to be there. So I don't know where we're going to keep them all. Just so through our lives, you know, through our whole lifetime. <laughs> I guess. Okay, so anyway, where, where did I go before I shared that horrifyingly sad story? <laughs> There's a point in things. The first time, the first cat that, that died, wait, what, what was the circumstances? Oh, oh, the owl. Okay, so we have this great cat. This was in Colorado. And he's walking along, and this owl comes down, and, and an owl can kill an animal in one hit. A great horned owl. He just came down, and bam, and then flew away. And God, God was telling us, should I have, what was he telling us? It was kind of relevant to tests and, and all that, just to be aware, be watch out. And also, we had signs that we had ignored. The owl was... Uh, Sco- scoping our house because it had babies and it was and it knew our cat was a a predator. We're not paying attention to signs. That was what God showed us. You guys aren't paying attention to signs, and so you let your cat out and you should never have done that while this owl was out. Anyway, so it meant something. So random it was is it random pain or is it discipline which has teaching involved in a correction? Okay, so that's what we have to, let's keep reading this verse. It says, uh, Hebrews 12, 7, endure hardship as discipline or as teaching. God is treating you as sons for what son is not disciplined by his father. As soon as we start accepting hardship as discipline, that's going to change everything. It's going to change everything. Okay, I'm going to learn something. Okay, I'm going to learn something. Okay, I'm going to learn something in this. So that's amazing. Okay, I, I I have an example. I have an illustration of Jacob. Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he was the father of uh, Joseph. But Jacob was in the middle of an elaborate plan to change the hearts of his murdering sons, to reunite his lost children, and to bring abundant food during a famine. So he's in the middle of a plan that God's working in his life, in his family's life, in his son's lives, to make everything work out great. And here's what he said, because this is, this is what we can say too. In Genesis 42, 36, their father Jacob said to them, you have deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more. And now you want to take Benjamin? Everything is against me, he says. Everything is against me. And sometimes we say, everything is against me. But everything wasn't against him. Everything was for him. Every, everything that was happening was for his family to get reunited, for the murdering sons to repent from their murderous ways or self-centered ways, and for his whole family to be provided for in the middle of a famine. And so he's like, this is all just random pain. This is horrible. No, we can't go there. We have to say God is in it. God is in it all. So don't be saying everything is against me. 
Throw away our, your uninvolved God. Throw away the God that, that, if you think you have a God and he's not involved, throw that one away and get a God that's involved in your life, okay? If you say God may exist, but he isn't involved in this situation, you are talking like an agnostic, not a Christian. Because a, an agnostic is like, yeah, God may exist, but he's out there and has nothing to do with me. Don't say that. God has everything to do with you. His hands are in, his hands are in your life. His hands are in your heart. They're, in, they're, they're going on and say, God, I trust you. God, I trust you. God, I trust you. God, I trust you. Just say it. Just say it over and over to him. Yes, God, I trust Let's all say it together. God, I trust you. Amen. So we're going we're gonna to hold on to trust in God. So this is, the, this is the close connection we're being invited to. There's a close connection that God wants us to be connected with. And it's in Matthew 6, 9. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be, or we make holy, your name. We ask a loving heavenly Father for help. Okay? Uh, our, our granddaughters, Emery and Lissy, have you seen them? They're really darling. And they sit right up here in the front row like little precious angels. Am I right? <laughs> Always praising the Lord. Question, why don't Emery or Lissy ask a force of nature for a snack? If they do that, they get no results. Listen to me. Emery and Lissy do not ask forces of nature for a snack or for lunch because if they did, they'd get no results. But if a child can ask a father, then you got a totally different thing. Good things will happen. You got good things happening when a child asks a father. We can't just ask favor or providence or car good karma to come be our blessing. You have to ask a father that you're his child and he's your father. You need to come into this relationship because pleading for good things to happen from karma is not going to do anything for you. People, people that do that and get a response are being fooled by demons. I'm gonna say it again. People that do that and then get a response are being fooled by demons. Why? So that they just keep going off away from the Lord. And so the demon will bring them a little trinket, throw it at their feet. They'll be like, ah, it worked. I'm going to pray to karma again or whatever. We ask a person, Matthew 7, 9, which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Get closer in your love relationship. This is what this message is all about. We're going to get closer. We're going to get closer to God. It's amazing to think about this. God has everything he could possibly need, but what he really wants is your love. He has everything he could possibly want. But what he really wants is your love, and he directly asks for it. In Deuteronomy 10, 12, And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. God wants your love to take priority over everything else. Okay, if you got, you got, uh, you just had a business, you just got some donkeys, and he's given an invitation, it's like, yes, this is what I've been waiting for, and you come face to face. Whenever, let, let love be your prevailing priority in all things, because you'll always choose the closer connection. If love's your motive, you'll always choose the closer connection. Right on? Okay, Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. Then we won't hold back or make any excuses why we can't come closer because we'll love him, you know? So just imagine him saying, so I want you to start, <laughs> I want you to start working on your dream language and your parables language. If you, if you see a word over and over again, what was that word you kept seeing on trucks and billboards and television? Remember it was on a truck? Just recently. Wow. 
No, it was in Colorado. <laughs> it was just a word, and it was just kind of a strange word. Was it really? Okay, the word friendly. And so, it's, I thought it was something else. But, but anyway, because that's an easy one. <laughs> I was going to tell him that you need to look it up in the dictionary. But you don't have to look up friendly. But you might look it up in the dictionary. It's like, what does it mean? What are all the meanings of this? What could it possibly be referring to? Who are my friends? Who's, is he friendly to me? And just start investigating the language, okay? I want you to decide right now that you're going to learn a new language, whatever it is. If it's, if it's license plates, you're going to start you're going to start zeroing in on them. That, Roger is the first person in my whole life I ever knew God talked to him through license plates. You too? Okay. Whew. See, it's growing. The language is growing. And, uh, but dreams is awesome. You should pay it. Write your dreams down. Okay? I don't want to have to get rough with you. <laughs> but I want to say this. Write your dreams down. <laughs> Because five years from now, the thing will be happening before your very eyes are like, whoa, I dreamed this five years ago. I would have totally spaced it out if I wouldn't have written it down. But you've got your dream journal right there, and you have dates on there. And sometimes if you look at one year, two year, three year, uh, exactly, they'll mean something, you know. It's like, oh, exactly three years ago, I dreamed this. So look at those two. So anyway, God wants to talk to us because he loves us. And we are willing to learn a, a new language. Right on. So let's stand up. We're going to pray. Amen. Praise God. Amen. We're just going to pray. And we don't have our band here, so they're, they're uh, not going to be able to do a last worship song. But we are going to pray and then be dismissed. So Lord Jesus, we thank you so much. We thank you so much that you are calling us closer. Lord God, I pray that when the invitation comes to come, come closer, to pick up the phone, let's talk, let's talk, let's talk, or, the, or to uh, come face to face, let's see each other. Lord God, that we don't have a hundred excuses as to why we can't do that. Why That's too much trouble. I, I can't start talking that way. I can't start interacting with you that way. That's too much effort. No, Lord God, we are going to make the effort. We are going to learn uh, what we need to learn. We are going to, um, f- even, w- even if we don't really know what we're saying, we're going to start speaking to you, Lord God, just like a baby does to its father. And just like we do when we start speaking in tongues to you, Lord, we just start with a sound. And Lord God, to you, it is beautiful, beautiful communication. But Lord God, we are just going to let the earth that is filled with the glory of God start to communicate the knowledge of the glory of God to us, Lord God. We're going to start opening our eyes, opening our hearts, and letting you speak in many different ways, Lord God, however you want to. Let the, this is your deal, Lord God. But lead us, because we are sheep that are willing to hear and listen. Your sheep hear your voice, and we are hearing your voice every way you want to speak. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Amen.